And for starters, we're very excited to announce that just last week, the Washington State Advisory Council on Historic Preservation voted to endorse the nomination of the Mary Hill Stonehenge Memorial to the National Register of Historic Places. So this evening, Katie and I will present a quick overview of the history and significance of the Stonehenge Memorial, after which our colleagues David and Maya will describe some of the findings of their conditions assessment of the monument. So like Mary Hill itself, the story of the Stonehenge Memorial starts with Sam Hill. Sam Hill was a businessman and philanthropist whose legacy in the Pacific Northwest includes everything from buildings to highways, but he's most well remembered for Mary Hill, which he originally intended to market as a model community for Quaker homes. When this idea didn't take, he used the land for road building demonstrations and raising cattle, and in 1914 began building the mansion that we all know as the Mary Hill Museum of Art. During World War I, however, construction paused as Sam Hill poured money into supporting Romanian and Belgian refugees. He was even briefly involved in on-the-ground support for the Allies in 1916 when the King of Belgium called on him to provide logistical advice on moving supplies within Russia. But as a Quaker, Hill was deeply affected by the loss of human life caused by the war. And so in 1918, before the war was even over, he decided to construct a memorial at Mary Hill dedicated to each of the local Klickitat County soldiers who had been killed in action in Europe. To commemorate the lives lost in a war like no other, Sam Hill wanted to build a war memorial like no other. He took his inspiration from Stonehenge, the famous prehistoric English monument you see here. The original Stonehenge, of course, is located on Salisbury Plain, about 90 miles west of London and about 5,000 miles east of Klickitat County. It consists of a ring of standing stones surmounted by stone lintels, and it is oriented towards the sunrise on the summer solstice. Stonehenge is generally believed to date from 3,000 to 2,000 years BCE. But why did Sam Hill select Stonehenge, a megalith constructed thousands of years prior on an island thousands of miles away for his World War I memorial at Mary Hill? Well, to understand that, we need to go back to English antiquary, natural philosopher, and writer John Aubrey, who in the 1600s theorized that stone circles such as Stonehenge were constructed for use by Druids a priesthood of ancient Britons whom the Romans had identified as practitioners of human sacrifice. Even after the monument's solar alignment had been recognized, the association between Stonehenge and ancient human sacrifice remained popular among both scientific and amateur audiences well into the early 20th century. So in selecting Stonehenge as the model for his war memorial, Hill drew a parallel between ancient human sacrifice for the appeasement of pagan deities, as he understood Stonehenge to symbolize, and what he believed to be an equally pointless and cruel loss of life caused by the Great War in Europe. So to help him plan the memorial, Hill consulted astronomer William Wallace Campbell, the director of the University of California's Lick Observatory, who happened to be visiting Goldendale in the spring of 1918 because the town was in the path of totality for a solar eclipse that year. Campbell made a special side trip to Mary Hill to measure the proposed memorial site and to advise Hill on creating an astronomically accurate replica. And while some of Campbell's recommendations varied slightly from the parameters of the original Stonehenge, Mary Hill's Stonehenge Memorial remains one of the most faithful replicas ever undertaken. So now I'd like to hand it off to my colleague, Katie Ewers, to describe the actual construction of the Stonehenge Memorial. Thank you, Matt. Sam Hill began construction on Mary Hill Stonehenge Memorial almost right away following Campbell's visit. His first step was determining which material to use. Although he wanted to quarry local stone, the available material wasn't durable enough and it was much too expensive to source enough for a full-size replica. And so he turned to the same material that he used for the Mary Hill Museum of Art, cast in place steel reinforced concrete. Ooh, pretty. Now, as Hill was very concerned with the authenticity of the color, the contractor developed a creative method to texture the surface of the concrete to mimic the appearance of hand hewn stone at the ancient. Oh, I like, you know. In order to get a rough, undulating look, 
The concrete floors were lined with crumpled up sheets of tin. The concrete itself was mixed oh. in sight and poured in lifts or successive horizontal. If you look closely at this trilithon or the yeah. gold frame shaped element at the center of the image, you can see the seams that indicate yeah, figured it. The jagged texture from the crumpled tin sheets is also very clear in this early photograph. The concrete looks much more weathered today. Mm -hmm. Once the material had been selected, construction on the memorial was completed in two phases. The first phase was just the altar, with a large low element at the center of the memorial. It was completed by late June 1918, more than four months before the end of the war, and dedicated in a public ceremony at the site on the 4th of July. At the lower right here is a photograph of Sam Hill holding the dedicatory plaque that would be installed on the top of the altar. And you can see at this time, none of those tall upright elements around the altar had yet been constructed. About 500 Klickitat County residents came to the 1918 dedication ceremony to see the unveiling of the altar and to hear read the names of their family and neighbors who died in the war. Edmund Meany, shown in this picture from the ceremony, was a UW professor and a friend of Sam Hill's and one of a few prominent Washingtonians who spoke at the dedication. A Seattle engineer and a Klickitat County War Council chairman also gave speeches at the event, which was held on site at Mary Hill. The second phase of construction included all of the upright elements of the memorial, and it was delayed for about a decade due to Sam Hill's other involvements and some financial constraints. When he finally returned to the project in 1928, up to 25 men were working on the project at one time, including several carpenters from Goldendale who built the concrete forms. The project was finally completed in 1929 and a second dedication was held on Memorial Day that year. The American Legion posts that Goldendale and White Salmon organized the second ceremony and the pastor of the Goldendale Methodist Church gave the benediction. The local Boy Scout troop ended the ceremony by lifting American flags off of the altar stone, formally unveiling the Mary Hill Stonehenge Memorial. The families of the soldiers the memorial is dedicated to were given a place of honor, but Sam Hill himself was delayed in New York following a trip overseas and he didn't make the ceremony. He is shown here with friends at the memorial, not at the ceremony, but soon after its completion. Sam Hill conveyed Stonehenge Memorial to the Mary Hill Museum of Art in late 1927, along with a significant portion of his land holdings in Klickitat County. Almost 100 years later, it's still under ownership of the museum today. The memorial is open to the public, many of you have likely been there, and ceremonies for the soldiers to whom it's dedicated are held every year. This photo is from a commemorative event on Armistice Day in 2018. Now, as unusual and perhaps eccentric as Mary Hill's Stonehenge Memorial seems, it's actually one of at least two dozen monuments and art pieces that were inspired by the ancient English Stonehenge and constructed in the US. Some of these were built to imitate Stonehenge's astronomical alignment or to test its engineering, but most of them were built as roadside attractions or eccentric art pieces. Some like Foamhenge in Virginia are attempts at fairly accurate reproductions but others like Carhenge in Alliance, Nebraska, and Fridgehenge in New Mexico are just whimsical. Almost all of these replicas were constructed in the mid 20th century or later, which makes Sam Hill's monument in Mary Hill not only one of the more serious replicas, but one of the earliest, if not the earliest, in the United States. So, this is a photo from an actual network. Mary Hill Stonehenge is also one of the earliest World War I memorials in the United States as his altar stone was dedicated more than four months before the end of the war. For this reason, and for its social commentary on the brutality of war, the memorial is eligible for inclusion in the National Register of Historic Places. It is really a unique reflection of the time of its construction and of an understanding of the ancient English Stonehenge that was common in the early 20th century. It is also significant as a particularly creative application of cast-in-place concrete, and for that interesting use of crumpled tin sheets to create the look of canteen stone. As Matt shared at the beginning of this presentation, we're very happy to report that given its significance, Mary Hill Stonehenge Memorial is slated to be added to the National Register within the next few weeks. And now to talk about plans for its preservation, I hand things off to my colleagues, David and Maya. Thank you, can you hear me? Yes, okay, good, just making yes. sure. Um, I'll go ahead and say next, um, I think Matt, you're advancing the slides. 
So thank you. This is perfect right here. Um, and so ARG, um, we were contacted uh, initially to address um, why the to address um, stabilizing Stonehenge because of concrete degradation. And so really step number one was understanding, you know, the building, the, the construction of Stonehenge, how it was made and the various repairs on the monument over the years. So as Katie and Matt explained, the monument was built over a, essentially a 10 year period of time and it's uh, a cast in place concrete embedded in rock. Um, the architect um, had wanted, obviously they wanted it to be stone, but they had concrete. So in, in that effort, what they did is they used battered metal formwork to form the concrete, which is why you have that distinct texture. So the, you can actually see, we'll go on to see what the original finish was. Um, over the years, the monument has been repaired. Um, in 1972, the altar stone was repaired. Um, in 1980, um, it was noted that the tops of the concrete forms um, were, had been a new uh, concrete service had been placed on them. And then there was work in 1995 and in 2000 which was select repair of the concrete elements and also an attempt to put um, water repellent on the monument to keep the water at bay, which was has been causing a lot of the issues. Essentially what happens is um, as the water penetrates the concrete, it uh, gets into the concrete and as it freezes and as it freezes, it expands and it basically spalls off the concrete. So in an effort to address that, that's why um, there's been all these repairs on it and also these attempts at the water repellent to keep the water out of the concrete monument. So next slide. So as um, Katie had touched on, uh, the first thing we wanted to understand again is the concrete construction. It was built basically out of, um, as it says here in an article, um, it was the cement was wheeled in by hand, a rock crusher was set up besides the road where you could enter the Stonehenge area. Um, the, the rock was dropped right into the crusher and it was screened and hauled and uh, combined with the sand into the concrete mix. So all of the materials came from the site, which is, um, it's just so great and so unusual um, and also makes finding repair material a little bit harder because all of the, set, all of the materials are local. Um, next slide. So really quickly, just terminology, the exterior is, um, is the circular ring of pillars with the lintel. Um, then we have the freestanding pillars. And then we have um, the, it, the arches on the inside um, are the trillisons. And then the small sort of, um, we have the freestanding pillars. I just wanna make sure as I talk about the different pictures, everybody knows what I'm talking about. Next slide. So the first thing that we had to do to really understand the conditions is um, uh, Candace, uh, the project manager who's not on the call with us um, today, and I generated drawings of Stonehenge and we documented every single inch of the monument to understand where the failure was and start to identify patterns of failure. So here's an image of um, looking down at the top of the, of the monument you'll see the bottom of the monument in general at all locations, including the, 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 the perimeter, the freestanding pillars, the trillithon, most the base of the building that we noted in general was in good condition. It was as you worked up to the top that you would see most of the weathering. Other things that we noted, for example, you could see old concrete uh, the tie to the formwork that stuck out and there's a little bit of rusting. There's spalling in some areas. I'll you'll show that in a minute on the freestanding pillars. But in general, it really is just the top of the monument that's exhibiting um, deterioration. So next slide. Here's the top. You can really see um, this is what the top of the monument looks like. The attempt to stabilize the deterioration at the top of the monument. You could see that it's cracking. Um, to the right, you'll see that was supposed to be, a, I wouldn't say a, a 90 degree angle at the top of the, the monument, but, but definitely not this eroded curve 
the little piece of corroded metal um, that you can see sticking out was most likely a cold joint. That's what we determined. But now the concrete is completely gone and it's exposed to weathering. Next slide. Um, there's also, <laughs> there's underneath little, it's become a natural habitat for some animals <laughs> that have uh, moved in. Um, next slide. And you can also see quite a bit of um, basically spalling. And so essentially what's happening is you know, as the concrete deteriorates, water seeps in, it freezes and it starts, starts to push off of flaking uh, pieces of concrete, which falls to the ground. And I think, you know, every spring there's a cleanup effort to clean up all of the spalling of the stone and of the concrete that falls to the ground. Next slide. And then, of course, here you can see this is the bottom of the trilithon. Um, I don't know, can you see, you probably can't see my arrow, but if you look to the, the right and to the left, um, where the vertical meets the horizontal, you can see these lines painted onto the concrete surface. That was, thank you, that was very consistent at, at all the trilithons. Um, curious, you know, could this have been painted at some point? We don't know, we didn't find any documentation, but that was an interesting finding. You can also see the, the pattern of the water as it seeps through the concrete. You can see the staining. Um, that's a result of just the water getting into the concrete. Next slide. And discoloring. Um, this is an example, really, I included this. You can really see how the monument wants to look, that crisp appearance of, of the, the concrete as it was poured into the battered tin and how it wanted to have a really a stone look uh, to it. Um, you can actually see streaking um, along the face, the surface of the concrete. We weren't sure why that was, um, but there was a lot of um, graffiti uh, and very well maintained, but you know, kind of scratched into the surface. And so, really, the monument needs um, uh, basically care um, to take it back to its original appearance. Next slide. And then um, this is just an example of, uh, for example, um, you could see again where the concrete has deteriorated and all of the aggregate is showing through uh, previous patch repairs, trying to stabilize that. Uh, one of the issues is finding a patch repair that's not going to naturally uh, spall away from the existing concrete. You want it to really blend in with the existing concrete so it's a long lasting patch. And so all of our work has been formulated to make sure that whatever repair we formulate, it's going to last and not start to weather at different rates. Next slide. And then uh, um, this is a final, another, a few, few examples of the very fine concrete um, and how it formed a really natural, sort of crisp concrete looking finish. And that was the original intent. And with that, I'm gonna hand it on to um, David Wessel who will address some of the testing and what our repair form, um, re re repair recommendations that we formulated. Thanks, Maya. Uh, before I do that, I wanna explain that we are following industry standards in the preservation of a cultural or historic resource and certainly this wonderful monument is important to the community and commu important to the state and really important to the United States. It's a wonderful monument that reflects uh, the early history of your community. And we're very excited to be a part of it. And the good news is that we're trying to preserve concrete rather than an assembly of refrigerators. So, the first part of any type of preservation, a properly implemented preservation program is documentation. And that's what Matt and Caitlin talked about. They documented the history. How did this come to be? And part of that is understanding the building uh, methodology and, and how the uh, original builders decided to construct the, uh, the memorial. The next thing we do, and then this is what Maya spoke to, was that we documented the physical conditions. And why do we do that? It's important to understand how much uh, type of deterioration we have, and that leads us through documentation to really understand the mechanisms of deterioration. Maya touched on this when she talked about how the uh, moisture and the rainwater 
gets into the pores of the concrete. But how do we know that the concrete uh, is being deteriorated by water or wind damage or some other type of uh, problem? So once we've done the history, once we've done the documentation of conditions, we turn to really the hard sciences in developing treatments for the proper conservation of this important memorial. And here you see photos of, we of the cores that we took of the monument in which we decided to do some testing and to understand better what was happening with the material. Now, early concrete is frequently very porous. And so water penetration can be an issue. Let's look at the next slide here. And here you see slices through the cores. I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail on, on these, but what we see on the right is that pink color. The pink color it is a indicator that we use to identify carbonation. Carbonation is when the concrete starts to lose its alkalinity and can no longer protect the reinforced steel that is within it and, and helping to hold the assembly together. It's important really to understand what is the condition of the concrete and also the grading. And here you see, we've taken a look at what type of uh, sand and gravel is inside. Okay, next, next slide. So after that, we, with that information that we really turned to the sciences to help us understand the mechanisms, the deterioration, we started to look at proposed repairs or remediation in an attempt to keep this monument uh, in place for as long as possible. And again, as Maya mentioned, the water is an issue. We learned that through the, uh, through the testing that we've done of the materials. And so we're looking at a range of different types of water repellents to apply to the, to the monument and the, and the concrete. Okay, next slide. We're also looking at ways to keep the water from coming down from the top and penetrating those horizontal surfaces, which are the most vulnerable parts of the monument. This is where the water really gets absorbed and it gets brought in into the interior of the assembly. And so these are just some uh, examples of uh, treatments that Candace put together where we're either looking at some type of metal that would go on top or other material to cap the top of the monument to keep the water off. Okay, next slide. And here's some more examples. Uh, we're also looking about how would we patch those uh, deteriorated areas and what are the right type of materials to use that are compatible with the original historic fabric or the historic concrete so that they are not either too hard or too soft and so that they match the physical characteristics of the original material. Okay, next slide. And so I'd just like to conclude with the uh, summary of the next step. And what is the next step? Well, very difficult to understand, first of all, from a cost perspective, what this would cost without more information. It's also difficult to understand if our proposed treatments would be successful. Would the patches actually adhere properly? Would they protect the damaged areas? And how would uh, the uh, capping of the stone work? And would it possibly cause some other problems that we're unaware of? And that's why the next step that's so important is testing the treatments. We've done our history, we've done our documentation, and we've developed treatments, and now it's time to test them in small areas so that we really understand what the best options are for preserving this wonderful historic resource. Hey, 
Okay. <laughs> uh, well, I'll stop talking if I see the video and then you'll know it's working. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so David, um, so the question was, um, the question was, hold on a second, I just want to read it. Can you go over again how the concrete forms were made? So essentially, the concrete would have been poured like any concrete. They would have built, you know, the, the sort of the form, but as far as where you would use uh, plywood now, what they did, and I, I think I remember Katie and Matt, <laughs> correct me mm -hmm. if I'm wrong, I, was, it was the architect who sort of was out there guiding uh, the battering of the former, because it was literally sheets of metal that were bent, and then um, it was installed, you know, into the formwork, and then, of course, it was used, you know, with the form ties, and then the concrete was poured, but it was literally, instead of what you would use, you know, plywood now, it was this bent metal, and yeah, in fact, you can too, still yes. see... Okay, and you can actually see where the formwork was snapped off in a lot of locations. And then if you look closely, you can also see the different pores as they went through where they stopped and poured again. Uh, but it's very unusual. And since I have the I have the platform here and the video is not going, I'm going to keep talking. But, um, you know, we talked about uh, one of the things that David mentioned was you know, the diff formulating different repairs, you know, one of the thoughts, um, and I, I would also say we work with um, Shomer and Sons, um, they helped us with this effort in the survey and doing the cores, and they've, and um, um, we talked a lot about, you know, what about, what about rebuilding the top of the exterior walls versus just repairing it? That is a valid repair option uh, at this point. Maybe not 50%, but maybe 70% of the cross section of the top portion of the exterior ring is missing. What about reconstructing it? But is that a proper preservation approach? And how do you reconstruct? Would you try to use bent, you know, forms? You know, uh, do you reach out? You know, if you go to those, um, for example, if you go to those. Um, uh, you know, sort of cheesy resorts in Las Vegas, and they can redo stone, you know what I mean, uh, with, um, with concrete. It's doable, but is that what we want? Is that what we want to see? So there was all these questions that sort of, you sort of scratch your head, like, how would we do this? And we, we want to approach this as a proper conservation project. It's the idea is that it's going to last another 100, 200 years. Um, and so I think our, our, our intent is to stabilize and keep as much historic fabric as possible, but it's worth, go ahead, David. <laughs> uh, I, was know, just gonna, I was going to add, I saw another question, are the concrete forms hollow? If so, how thick? So it's very likely the way this uh, monument was formed was it, it was first with framing lumber, so two by fours, and then the sheet metal that uh, Maya described would have been f lining that sheet metal, or excuse me, that framing uh, lumber. And then they would have put some type of release agent, probably coated it with oil, so that when they stripped the wood framing and then they stripped the sheet metal, the bent sheet metal, that it would come off easily without sticking to the concrete. Now, what's interesting is this reflects a lot of interest in the Uni United States at the time in forming concrete in different ways to make it look like stone or to make it look like other materials that it was not. So interesting that at Mary Hill, we have kind of an adaptation of some ideas that were going around the, the whole United States at the period. So we have another question, Maya. Would we, yeah, would you re move or relocate for a true Stonehenge solstice sunset or sunrise? You mean remove the actual monument? No, no, no. The the, uh, the Mary oh. the, the Stonehenge Memorial is is off by a few few degrees compared to the original, uh, despite the the help of Mr. Campbell, Dr. Campbell. So uh, I don't think I think that would be seen as as just another sort of 
characteristic of the existing replica in the way that it's not a perfect reproduction and it incorporates not only some thinking at the time about the use of Stonehenge, but also some, uh, you know, evolving understanding of the astronomical significance of the monument. So, and, and I think that it would be, I mean, Maya and David would know better, but I think it would probably be devilishly hard to rotate every member a few degrees, but Katie? Well, I was just gonna add, so there's a, a difference of about five degrees in latitude between this location and the original Stonehenge. But one of the other problems is that Mount Adams blocks the, um, Sunrise or the sunrise, so we all, we would have to move the mountain too. Yes, yes. <laughs> okay, so shall we? Move? I think I have the video working now. My apologies; it must have just came on my computer and not on. Um. Good. Perfect. Great. Sorry. To the memory of the soldiers and sailors of Klickitat County who gave their lives in defense of their country. This monument is erected in hope that others, inspired by the example of their valor and their heroism, may share in that love of liberty and burn with that fire of patriotism, which death alone can quench. James Henry Allen. Charles Auer, Dewey V. Bromley, John W. Cheshire, William O. Clary, Evan Childs, James D. Duncan, Harry Godfordson, Robert F. Graham, Louis Lydell, Carl A. Lester, Edward Limblad, Henry O. Pindle, Robert F. Venable. Well, there you have it. It was the first time I've ever tried to share video, but I just wanted everybody to see that because that's what this monument is really all about. Um, it's um, more about these people who gave um, their lives for their country. Also, it's a little bit, a little bit about having picnics there and joining family and friends and seeing something really wonderful. But um, we're really hoping that we can move forward and preserve this monument for the next several decades, maybe even the next hundred years. And if anybody would be interested in supporting this, get a hold of me. I'm Colleen Shaproth. I'm the director of Mary Hill Museum. Just call the museum and they'll connect me or connect you to me. And we will talk a little bit. And then finally, I do want to um, acknowledge all the people who participated in, um, in helping us so far. And these um, include um, a number of individuals. And I'm going to put the list up so we get it correct. Because they're very important to what the museum is doing. And, um, and I just want you to see, oops, let me get it up here. I just want to thank the Architectural Resources Group, who've not only done all this work, but contributed toward the project, the BNSF Foundation, the Hugh and Jane Ferguson Foundation, the Kinsman Foundation, the Klickitat County Historical Preservation Grant folks, and Larry and Constant Olson, who gave in memory of Ray and Beth Olson. Uh, the, it's really important, all the work we've done so far, doing the initial assessment, doing the studies, thinking about going to a mock-up, and of course, applying to get the monument or the memorial on the um, National Register is really, really important for the future of the memorial, and I speak from the heart when I say that. 
I want to thank Louise Palermo for doing such a beautiful job reading all the names in the video. And I want to um, thank Whitney Gnomes for putting it all together for us. They did a fantastic job and we'll be airing that video on Memorial Day as well. I understand there will be Memorial Day services probably held at the um, Klickitat County Veterans Memorial on Memorial Day. So if you're out and about in the area, you may want to check into that. Again, um, unless there are any more questions, maybe we have some. Oh, they want to know what, if we know how much it would cost, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I know that the next phase is the mock-up is going to be around 100, roughly $160,000 and we're writing grants um, to do that as we speak. Do you guys want to tackle anything beyond that? I would just say um, that it really does depend on, um, so step number one is to do this mock-up. And as David said, the idea is, is we like to, number one, um, as they go up and they remove uh, the, the, the concrete at the top of the pillars and the exterior walls, how much concrete comes off. Um, when they put the, the patch material, how much patch material is going to need, is going to be used? How much time does it all take? So really, it's really hard to say what the actual cost is going to be in that we have to kind of see how it, that, and that's what we're recommending to pair is to sort of, that would determine which repair methodology we are going to recommend. So we absolutely need to do this mock-up to have a real understanding as to the cost. Hope that answered the question. Are there any other questions to go before our panel tonight? Well, I want to thank all of you for coming, all, the, all of our friends and supporters and members who are here tonight. I'm really grateful you came to listen to this program. It is an important monument. Um, to the county, to the museum, because of Sam Hill, and for many, many other reasons. And I hope you come and visit us soon. So take care and have a good evening. Thanks, everyone.